If you're seeking freedom in a revolution, oh, if you're seeking freedom, you won't find it there. For once the guns stop blazing, you'll find it amazing how the world can drag on just as before. If you're seeking freedom in a marble mansion, oh, if you're seeking freedom, you won't find it there. For even when it's sunny, you'll be counting money, keeping up that showcase, your face lined with care. And if you're seeking freedom on a throne of power, oh, if you're seeking freedom, you won't find it there. For though men all obey you, what if they betray you? Tends to be and waiting for foes everywhere. But if you're seeking freedom, cast away desires. Why barter like a beggar, you've wealth everywhere. For never can you buy it, grasp and you deny it. Freedom can't be hoarded, it's free as the air. And if you're seeking freedom, seek it on the mountains, got sunlight on your shoulders, the wind in your hair. For there's no one can hold you, boss about or mold you, once your heart is free, you'll be king everywhere. For there's no one can hold you, boss about or mold you, once your heart is free, you'll be king everywhere. Good morning, everyone, and then welcome. I wanted to start this morning with this reading from Patanjali, because the subject is the importance of the guru, and I think this will help illustrate the importance of the guru. For one who can distinguish between the mind and the self, thoughts in the mind cease completely. It's a very profound key to expanding our consciousness. Because that's the, the challenge of meditation is to cease the thoughts. If we can calm the thoughts in the mind, then and only then can we really touch the true self. Because what this means is that, in fact, um, I believe Swami says it, um, the mind is only a reflection of the more distant seeming indwelling self or soul, which never acts directly in the body. That's very important. We go through our lives day in and day out and we never really, the, our true self, the part of me that says, I am, the part of me that is immortal, never really acts directly in the body because the filter of the mind or the ego, which is associated with these form. Remember, Yogananda defined the soul as, I mean the ego as, the soul's attachment or identification with, body, with the body. But Master makes, um, defines that even further. It's the identification, not only with the body, but with form. And so the secret to understanding the true nature of the soul is to realize that it is in no way bound by any limitation, especially by any form. That means it's pure consciousness, and consciousness doesn't have a limitation. It doesn't have anything that can bind it or limit it in any way. 
the soul never acts directly in the body until or unless we reach the state of no thought. And that's when the mind is pushed aside and we can view our true nature. These are, this is profound. This is the key to why the, uh, there is such an importance of the guru, because it's the guru who brings these kinds of tre- truths and shows us that this is the doorway to self-realization, to our tr- true perception, soul perception. If the soul never acts directly on the body, and this is another secret of a great of the true Kriya, um, the true Kriya masters. Yogananda said that that as long as there is any current, any nerve energy still going down the spine, it's impossible to calm the mind completely. I don't want to discourage you because it's not uh, actually impossible or even that difficult in order to achieve that uh, state where we reverse the energy in the spine. But that is exactly what Kriya does is, is as we magnetize the spine, there's two elements to Kriya, to bring the energy in and to bring the energy up. And once we succeed in bringing the energy of the nervous system up, then only can the mind be at rest, or the body be at rest, and when the body as is at complete rest, is the only way to absolutely calm the mind. And so, in order to really reach this state of inner realization, and let me just, uh, I'll give you an example. Yogananda said, the way to know somebody else's thoughts is to make the mind a complete calm or blank photographic plate. You know, the way they used to develop, before digital photography, they used to develop film uh, on a white or, or clear photographic plate with the film. He said, if you make your mind that way, if you can sit in that state as long as you want to sit in that state, not just because you happened on upon it for a few minutes or a few seconds even that you achieve stillness, but that you train and discipline the mind to where you sit in that state, then he said you receive from another person that actual photographic image of their thoughts, but not even only their thoughts. He was able to say, ah, you have a sour taste in your mouth, or he could feel the sensations of, the, of other people. But then he even took it another step. Again, the importance of the guru. He said, it's not enough to study the atom. You must become the atom. And that also means you make the mind like a still or blank photographic plate, then you are able to put your mind on anything you want to and know that thing. So he could see the workings of the atom. He said, you, we all know this, in his beautiful poetry and in his experience of, in cosmic consciousness, he beheld oceans of electrons. I mean, we're talking about a guru who is able to sort of take the torch and lead us into deeper and deeper levels of realization into spirit. Now I wanted to also show you, um, because I want to take it as far out as we can, and then I would like to try to bring it back into something that's real to us, but um, this is a typical galaxy in our universe. We've all seen them. They're beautiful. And Master says, and we know this to be true from um, astronomy, that in our galaxy, we're out here on the edge. Master said, really, the further away you get from the grand center of a galaxy, the more 
uh, Rajasic. We're in a Rajasic galaxy anyway, in a Rajasic part of the universe. But we're out here on an edge someplace, a little tiny star system with uh, our little group of planets around one of these little stars. I mean, the whole thing is immense. When you see it from the side, it's a disk. You don't normally see that, but, the, but so a, a galaxy throws out all this debris from the center, and it's a disk, but still even the disk is no small thing from one, from the top of the disk debris, if you will, to the bottom of the disk. But still, it's the astounding thing is that this is one, but there's billions of galaxies, and in just one galaxy, it's so huge. So then, on top of this, we're asked with our little human minds to understand that in the space that gives birth to these billions of galaxies, Master called space God's body. So from God's body comes billions of these galaxies and it's a field of consciousness that is giving birth. Spirit is another word we use, but um, science now says non-locality. So you have science, you have the mystics, you have everybody now agreeing at least on one point that everything seems to be riding or existing on a base of consciousness. And so even though science calls it non-locality, what's another word that we all know? If non-locality means that, that there is a presence throughout space that isn't local to any one place, it's non-local to one place, it means it's local every place, and we all know that word in a mystical term to be omnipresent. It's omnipresent in every part of space, or it's non-local to any one particular point. So science just turned the coin around and named the same thing, but used a different term. But here is this field of consciousness which is giving birth to this incredible vastness of life and of existence. So I wanted to quote Swami because he addresses this fact in um, the um, Promise of Immortality, the book that he, that he wrote. He says, if I in fact brought it, I think I did. He says, people cannot imagine God at first as anything but a larger-than-life image of themselves, subject to all the emotions that afflict them, like anger, pride, jealousy, and the whole Pandora's box of human weaknesses. For it is difficult for anyone to imagine a conscious, infinite being capable of manifesting the vast universe with its countless billions of galaxies, each one containing hundreds of billions of suns like our own. And to this immensity, the seemingly contradictory because softening quality of love, and describe that love as caring for each of us separately and individually, and we have a concept that is vast beyond all the powers of human imagination. We can only shelve the concept for a while while we visualize infinity reduced to dimensions comprehensible to our human brains. Then he finishes that by saying, rare indeed is that is the seeker of truth who feels no need to visualize God in some human aspect like the Divine Mother, Heavenly Father, or Eternal Friend. It's not that it's, it's, not that it's uh, wrong to visualize God in those images. We do. And, the, and Krishna recommends that we do because it's difficult to hold some sort of infinite concept. 
But as we know, even in the story of Ramakrishna, at some point, we need to break through this idea that God has a form and also allow our minds, our awareness, to start to expand in the idea of infinity, that there is no, nothing that limits the soul, that once we know there is no confine, no borders to our awareness, then you can become the atom. You can become the fish of the sea. You can become timeless. And that's another thing. Let me just again read another quote from Yogananda. He says, when I know the quote, but I wasn't there. Um, When I became one with spirit, I remembered, he said, that it was I who out of the void, my, my void potent thought, first cast out the spiral nebulae, the gases, the stardust. Then I became the um, suns and the (coughs) earths and the fishes of the sea. When we become one with spirit, then nothing is forgotten and nothing is held back. We are Sat-Chit-Ananda, ever-existing, ever-conscious, ever-new bliss, individualized. Spirit, non-locality, omnipresence is sat chit ananda we are that same essence individualized so the creation we see around us the atoms the galaxies everything is born and everything dies we see it constantly including the a level that we don't see which the atoms everything i remember when i first got on the path years ago I remembered Swami saying, remember, it's important to remember, to think of this body that in a hundred years, it's going to be pushing up daisies some, in some field, some place. Everything in this creation ends up reverting back to basic ele- elements. And so, as we learned in school, energy can neither be created nor destroyed, it can only change form. So nothing, even energy is a is an eternal substance, if you will. But that energy is also an aspect of Satchitananda, because energy comes from the consciousness behind vibration, and so creation can be nothing but consciousness in vibration. So we have we have an awareness behind creation and we have an awareness in creation. And that's what Yogananda taught about becoming one with Christ consciousness, but then also realizing the state of cosmic consciousness, the state of awareness behind creation. I want to just also read another quote from Master. I think we're beginning to realize the importance of the Guru, because he says, When no object of any kind had come into being, spirit existed. And this is the story we all know, whether it's in the Christian Bible or or every scripture, teaches that there was um, no existence. And then the way that the, uh, the Christian, or the way that the Western Bible says is, um, and this is important. Spirit moved, and God said, let there be light. So, there already was a spirit that existed before this fine element of light, which is what everything is born from. And this is why it's so important to realize when Master talks about creation being the dream of God, it can be nothing else. It's consciousness, and that, and then he's dreaming creation, and that's why they use the term light. But it isn't just a fairy tale term. Light is the essence of what we're seeing. I don't have a. I do have a candle burning here. He, 
I want to just use this for a minute. He says, Master says, think of the thought of a candle flame, and we all have an, a somewhat vague image of a candle flame. But, he says, if you dream a candle flame, it is a perceptible image, a very clear perceptible image, it, as clear, he says, as if you see it with your own eyes. And the reason that that is, and it's this very, also a very important aspect of yoga, is that he said, we dream clear and vivid images for one very simple reason. When we sleep, all the energy of the body withdraws into the spine, it withdraws from the senses, it withdraws from the organs, and it rests in the brain. And so, and it is only that extra energy that changes our perception from a vague thought, which we might have right now, to a clear and vivid image when we sleep. It's simply the extra energy in the higher centers that allows us to see clear and vivid images. Again, that's why we practice Kriya. We do anything we can. One time, Yogananda even, uh, I'm sorry, Swami even said, stand on your head if you need to in order to let gravity pull the energy to the higher centers because that's the idea is take the time to visualize, to imagine, to do everything you can, to do your Kriya, to do your devotion, to do your Hong Sa, focused at the point between the eyebrows because by the magnet of willpower, we can pull the energy down the spine or we can pull the energy up the spine. We can coax the energy. It's an important uh, truth of Kriya, of spiritual practices, is that energy follows awareness. To an untrained person, normally we're the victims of our bodies, if you will, and so awareness follows energy. If I'm sexually aroused, my awareness is going to be in the sexual organs and it's very difficult to pull that energy up. Somebody said to me once when I used that example, well, why would you want to pull your energy away from a pleasurable experience? Okay, that was a valid uh, point. If somebody stomps on my toe, the same thing happens. Awareness, uh, the energy in the body goes to the toe in order to begin the healing process. You feel that energy because your toe is going it's throbbing. It's the energy. Master with a group of disciples once was rolling a big huge piece of cement in place at the wishing well on Mount Washington and with the, and they, they got away from the disciples and it fell on Master's foot and literally crushed his foot. They, by the, when they were able to get the cement up and get his foot freed, it was obviously badly broken. Let's just set it down. Oop, we spilled some water too, I think. And he said, um, they were, the disciples were just uh, aghast. And, the, and he said, I want to show you something. And he said, if I don't allow my awareness to go down to my foot, and he stood there and talked with him just as calmly as I'm talking with you right now. His foot was mangled and broken, and there he was talking with him. But he said, if I allow my awareness to follow the energy down, then of course I'm aware of the body. Maybe some of you have heard that tape too. There's this wonderful uh, recording and he says um, an animal doesn't have the same sense of I am. They do have that sense but it's always in levels. We're, we have a, the highest refined nervous system which allows us really to reflect back on ourselves and say I am. So if an animal hurts his paw like a dog, if he hurts his paw, he doesn't have the same degree. He's, he feels the pain, but he doesn't say, he doesn't have the same sense of identification. He doesn't say, oh, it's my 
hand, but we say that. Oh, it's my hand. And Master said, that's why we suffer. It's only be that mental concept that we say, oh, it's my hand, and my hand is hurt. And so he said, that in intensifies the level of pain because we identify and say, it's my hand. And then he says in this recording, and that's why I want you to be tough. And he uses that word, he goes, be tough. Because he said, you can, just as he did, practice not going with the energy of the body, but being the master of the body and being the master of your energy. You control it and you learn, you begin to learn to do that simply by starting to learn the basics of concentration. Because if we learn to concentrate here, if it was really perfected, you could hold your hand right over a candle flame and let your hand burn if you really, not that you want to do that, you don't want to be radical or stupid, but um, you could, you do, would have that ability, and that's when the masters then begin to accomplish the level of awareness where their minds are concentrated, their minds are still, their minds are withdrawn from identification with body consciousness, and then consciousness begins to expand into anything that you want. He, he told this lovely story. I, I find it amusing, amusing as an American, but you know, America has the holiday, the, the Thanksgiving tradition, and it's a very nice tradition to be thankful for God, to God, and be thankful to, we at Ananda often just write uh, notes of thanksgiving or um, appreciation to other people in the community, the, the day of the banquet, and we, we share those notes with everybody that we appreciate them as part of our spiritual family. He said, it's a, he to, so told America always, he said, that's a wonderful holiday, not so great for the turkey. But he said, I have put my mind, my consciousness in the turkey, and to their good fortune, they don't suffer much, not like a, a cow or a mammal, who has a higher level of awareness, and they suffer when you kill them, and that is the reason why he didn't recommend that you eat meat, of course, is because that fear and that vibration also penetrates the meat. But he said over and over again, he could put his mind on, his consciousness on anything that he wanted to experience or to investigate, because he had achieved that ability to withdraw it from the identification with the body. And that's what yoga is all about, is bringing the ener teaching ourselves to bring the energy in and up the spine. And once we have withdrawn the energy from the body, the mind can become very calm. Remember, thoughts are universally rooted, and so they're always out there like radio waves and we can tune to them or we can tune them out. And once we tune them out, you can go into a still state of awareness and be, and just simply be. And that's when we begin to commune with God, with the Masters, with Spirit, but we have to. And it isn't, you know, um, somebody said to me, stillness sounds pretty boring to me. And it's a good point, it does, until you realize, again, the importance of the Guru, because Master said, there's a whole nother universe on the other side of creation. It is consciousness. Everything is consciousness. And we have to understand that there is a whole blissful consciousness on the other side of creation. It wasn't until Spirit moved and God said, let there be light. But understand that story of creation, the masters are telling us, or, or if we know the uh, story of the prodigal son in the Bible, they were with God, and then they wanted to go out from God and explore the foreign land, and as Yogananda interprets that Bible passage, the foreign land of material existence. But all masters, including Jesus, said, my Father's kingdom is not of this world. This isn't our, our place. We're visitors. We're temporary visitors. But we also are not immortal. 
I mean, we're not mortal. We are immortal. And so we need to remember that. And you need, we need to understand not only do we want to remember it, we want to realize it because only when we do realize that we are temporary visitors, we are immortal, but we are visiting a mortal place, a place that everything has birth and everything dies. And when we realize it's just a dream, then you know your immortality. And the way that we realize it is a dream is always how the yogis taught. When the mind is deeply calm, then the inner light spontaneously appears. And again, it's all about energy control in the body, devotion, concentration, resting here and calming the mind. And when the mind is deeply calm, the inner light spontaneously appears. And Jesus said, and so does the Old Testament said, says that uh, you will hear, it says it this way, you will, uh, you will hear his, no, you will, um, let me just get the quote. His name shall be in your forehead, and there you need neither the sun or the light of a candle or any light because the Lord God has given you light and ye shall reign forever and forever. That means that once you see that light, the inner light of spirit behind creation, then you know your, your immortality. You know your immortal self. But you won't know it. We can intellectually know it, but we won't know it until we merge with that light of spirit, the light of God's presence behind creation. So again, I'm just going to finish this part by reading what Master says. And I want you to, I'm going to read it once. The, uh, the blissful spirit is invisible, existing in his home of infinity. Actually, this is, let's just back up. This is, we'll read it before creation was. When no object of any kind had come into being, spirit existed. The blissful spirit was invincible, uh, invisible, existing alone in the home of infinity. Spirit is that which was and will be whether the universe does or does not exist. Spirit is nameless and formless. Remember, we're describing Sat Chit Ananda. Spirit is not knowable by the limitations of the understanding, but that does not mean that spirit is unknowable because spirit can be felt. The state of bliss, which is deeper than peace and is always new and unceasing, that is the only quality of spirit. When you feel that, nothing else satisfies, then you have true spiritual consciousness. Now, I want to read that again, but I want you to put it in the f first person. When no object of any kind had come into being, I existed. The blissful I is invisible, existing alone in my home of infinity. I am that which was and will be whether the universe does or does not exist. I am nameless and formless. I am not knowable by the limitations of understanding, but that does not mean that I can't be known or that I can't know myself because I can be felt. I am the state of bliss which is deeper than peace and is always new and unceasing. That is my only quality. When I feel that, nothing else satisfies then I have true spiritual consciousness. Because that is Sat Chit Ananda, and we are Sat Chit Ananda individualized. And when we realize that we are Sat Chit Ananda individualized, and when that little light in us merges with the great light of spirit, 
you never lose that sense of I, but you expand that sense of I into everything. And when we have that, then we have true spiritual consciousness. Thank you.